Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. My name is Henry Smith, and I'm your host, and I'm glad you're with us today. Today we're going to begin a four-part series focusing on worldview and worldview influences in our modern culture. Now, typically on Digging for Truth, we talk about archaeology and evidences related to the reliability of the Bible. We do some apologetics, but there are important worldview issues that are impacting Western civilization and the church to such a large degree that we can't avoid talking about them. And so today, I'm joined by a friend of mine, uh, Joshua Klein, who has studied uh, worldview extensively and the influences that are taking place in modern culture and in the church. And we're going to be exploring those in depth over the next four episodes. So we hope that you'll stay with us through them. There's some complexity to the discussion that we're going to be having, but we hope that you'll follow along with us, that you'll understand the importance of our discussion, and that you'll be edified in the name of Jesus. All right, now, Josh, welcome to Digging for Truth, my friend. It's good to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Honey. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, we, we should, for the interest of transparency, you and I have had similar conversations like this one uh, uh, on vacation together at yes. the uh, sort of the kitchen table, as it were. Yep. And uh, you've been spending many years of your uh, ministry and life focusing on worldview and the issues culturally that impact us and why people think the way they think. Um, before we get to that, though, I'd like you to share just a little bit with the audience, a little bit about yourself and why maybe these subjects are a passion of yours and a little bit, of, a little bit about that, if you would. Oh, sure. Uh, well, I've, I've been involved in education for over 20 years and working with young people. And as we see the changes that have taken place in our culture, you see the impact that the ideas that we're going to talk about today have, especially on people's, like you said, worldview and how that impacts their, ultimately, their perception of uh, what's good and bad and right and wrong and, and how they fit into uh, what the Bible says about, you know, is anyone good? No one's good but God. And, and when you get into uh, issues of choices that they make in life, and ultimately th the concern is salvation. You know, we want right. to make sure that they understand that we're all sinners, that we all need to be saved by the grace of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And these ideas that we're going to talk about, I see them as uh, false paths. And uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis one time said that, you know, if you're wandering in the desert and you miss the only spring there, it doesn't matter what path you take, you've missed the only spring. And so I think these are false paths, and I think that we need to um, expose them as such and help people see what's really happening so that they can ultimately know what's true, and uh, ultimately that will lead them back to the Bible and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen to that. You and I have a, a great passion for this, and I think uh, we, we hope that uh, our friends uh, in the audience will be edified by it. Now, here on Digging for Truth, we, we always teach the, the, that the authority of Scripture is of the utmost authority, the authority of Christ and Scripture. We call them equal fount, founts of divine, infallible authority. So we, we need to begin there. So when we ask the question, you know, why are you going to talk about Marxism, neo-Marxism, critical theory, critical race theory, postmodernism, and all these terms, some people might say, well, what are you talking about all that for? Why don't you just preach the gospel? Yeah. But we need to lay a foundation of why it's legitimate for us to talk about and critique these ideas. So let's start with some scripture. You want right, to go yeah. ahead with that, please. Uh, in Ephesians 5, we read, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. And then we read in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one who takes you cap see to it that there is no one who takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception in accordance with human tradition, in accordance with the elementary principles of the world, rather than in accordance with Christ. So it talks about uh, the fruit that these ideas produce. Yes. And is it good fruit or is it bad fruit? And if it's bad fruit, then we're told to expose these things and not to be deceived. So uh, if, if the Word of God is our foundation, 
like uh, we talked about before, the, the Lord Jesus Christ said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And so the Bible says to take every thought captive and to destroy these arguments and these things that are built up against the knowledge of the truth. And so that's, I think, important as a believer that we are aware of what's happening in the culture and to expose those things that are not in accord with what the scripture teaches us. Yeah, that, that, that's excellent. That's right. That's just, so it's sort of a holistic way of looking at it. You know, Paul is addressing here in Ephesians, not just, we're not just talking about, typically in the church, we tend to think about moral, the moral life. And certainly that the unfruitful fe- deeds of darkness have to do with the moral life. But ideas lead to immorality and to idolatry and, and uh, they attach themselves to our sin nature. So it's really important for us to understand this. You know, I was thinking too, Josh, of, of 1 Chronicles 12, that the men of Issachar understood the times and what Israel should do. Right. Now, we're not Israel, but we're the church, we're the covenant people of God. Um, talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on that, because... Uh, you know, it seems self-evident to us that we ought to critique these things, but maybe there's some people out there that are watching that are like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, why, why are you talking about this stuff? Can't we talk, just talk about Jesus? Right. Well, it, uh, it was Joseph Stalin who said that ideas are more powerful than guns. We would not let our enemies have guns. Why should we let them have ideas? And it's interesting that, you know, people who are diametrically opposed to the Word of God, understand the importance of ideas. And if we have false thinking, then that's going to lead to false actions. And ultimately, again, if we're, if we're being led by the Spirit and taking every thought captive, these, these things are important. We can't just pretend that they're not happening because not only, not only do they influence what's happening in, in the society as a whole in terms of legislation and, and organizations, but individuals too, right? I think a lot of the, these things that we're, we're going to talk about, uh, they're marketed as being good. They appeal to things that we would all agree right. that are good and that we should be pursuing, but there's a twist there that a lot yes. of people don't see. And, and they don't see like the end goal for the people who are espousing these things is not the end goal for people who are trying to um, live in a, in a pleasing way to the Lord. So. So we want, to, we want to appeal to the person who has genuine concerns about their fellow man, because a lot of this has to do with what we ought to do as a society as it relates to our fellow man. And, uh, but there's certain idea structures that, that, that flow out of that that we're going to argue actually are destructive to the well-being of man yes. and that are antithetical uh, to the gospel. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm here with my friend Joshua Klein. We're going to be uh, diving deep into worldview and various concepts that we've already introduced, and we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm your host. Glad to have you with us today. And I'm here with Joshua Klein, my friend, and we're talking about worldviews. Now, speaking of worldviews, let, let's talk about uh, some of the main, sort of four main elements of worldview that, you know, people like us consciously, we think about concretely worldview. But actually, everyone assumes these things that we're about to discuss, even if they don't articulate it in particular terms in their everyday life. So let's start with that. Yeah, I, th- I think everyone has a worldview, even if you don't recognize that you have a view. Right. Or, develop, or right. develop it formally. Right. Yeah. And so I think the worldview is based on what are called the four fundamental questions of life. Origin, how did we get here? Why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, meaning, what's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? Why do I get out of bed every morning? 
morality, how should I behave? Is there good and bad and right and wrong? And if so, like who determines that? And then destiny, what happens when I die? And, and those four questions make up your worldview. It's like a, a pair of glasses that you see the world through. And so even if you say, well, I don't care about those things. I don't care how I got here or why there is anything. I don't care why I'm here. I don't care how I should behave. And I don't care what happens when I die. That's your worldview. And that, <laughs> yes. that, will, that will affect the choices that you make in your life. So it's, it's yes. something that's unavoidable. Everyone has one, but we, we would hope that the answers to those four questions are true. And we have a, a worldview that leads us to the truth. Yeah, so, so even the position of, uh, let's, let's spin off of that a little bit, somebody who claims you can't or don't know, can't know these things, like you can't know what happens to you when you die. Let's use that as an example. That, in effect, is a worldview claim itself. Yes. It's claiming, first of all, that God has not revealed what happens to you when you die. That's a sweeping claim. So ignorance or agnosticism is a worldview in itself. Yeah. So it's unavoid. What I hear you saying is that worldview is unavoidable. Right. Can't you can't escape from it. All right. So one element of worldview that we're going to be getting into is uh, you use the illustration of foundations, and it has to do with our understanding of the nature of man. Right. So how our culture at large views man versus how the Bible, how God tells us what man is and what his or her problem is. And there's a clash between those. Let's, let's develop that. Right. Well, I think uh, your, your perception of what human nature is like is the foundation on which you build a society. So I think there's three main societal institutions. There, there is uh, government. The two key roles of government are to provide order and security. Do argue that the government should do a lot of other things, but those are the two things, order and security. And then you have religion, which shapes the culture, and then you have business, which determines the standard of living. And how you view human nature influences the role that all three of those social institutions should take, right? I mean, and I think from the biblical view, you look at human nature and you say that man is sinful. That is our biggest problem, and that we are primarily motivated by self-interest. That even the good things that I do, I could find some core root of how that benefits me, right? right and so if, right. if that's true, then I'm going to create a very different society than I would if I took the view that's espoused by the, the kind of cultural Marxism that we're talking about today. Yes. And that finds its root in people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the Enlightenment philosopher, who said that essentially people are good, that, that human beings are good, and that ultimately they're corrupted by society. So the answer to that conundrum. It's sort of like the chicken and the egg, what came first, the corrupt society or the corrupt people. But he said yes. that if you could fix the society, then you could fix the people. And then that would usher in this pathway to some sort of secular utopia where all the society, and that was the whole, one of the whole uh, goals of the Enlightenment was to find natural laws that applied not to nature, but to people. And then if you could apply those natural laws to society, you could fix society, and then we would all you know, live in this utopia. Interesting, the utopia in Greek means no place, right? So <laughs> it, it's not even something that's real. But, that, but that's the goal. Talk about like, irony, yeah. yeah. That's the goal, to, to, to get to this place where you know, everybody is happy with their lot in life, and everything's great, and there's no crime, and there's no poverty, and everybody's doing the best they can for the benefit of the other, and so on. But I, I think if, if the Bible's right, and we are fallen, and, and we are motivated by self-interest, then that, that view and every structure that you build on that foundation is doomed to failure because this, the foundation's wrong. The foundation's wrong. Yeah, you remind me of Psalm 11.3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Yeah. Right? We see illustrations by Jesus, you know, building your house on what? Rock, bed bedrock, right. sand, what happens when you do that? So let, let's explore this a little bit. You, you said, this has always seemed so strange to me. Uh, societies corrupt, uh, the, society corrupts people, but people are not inherently corrupt. So how, the logic of it doesn't make any sense. How does society become corrupt if people aren't inherently corrupt? Yeah. It it's always seems to me to be, very strange that you think if you fix society, you'll get rid of the corruption. Right. Let's talk about the inherent illogic of that viewpoint. Well, I think anybody who, who has ever been a parent knows that you don't have to teach your kid to do bad things. You don't have to teach your kid to deceive you. You don't have to teach your kid to be selfish. 
and you know, to, to not want to share and all that sort of stuff. You have to teach them to be kind to other people and to share and to be uh, nice to people and things like that. So, yeah. you know, and, and you I know cult, you cultivate that. Yeah, that right stuff now. comes naturally, right? To, yeah. to, to, <laughs> to do the wrong thing. And, and again, that's what the Bible says. Like, I, I don't yeah. have to work to be bad. Like, I could do that easily. Yeah. It's I have to, it's, it's to do the right thing that causes me to stop and say, oh, uh, okay. Yes. I know I shouldn't do that. I'm going to, I'm going to choose the other path. So, so that, that doesn't make a lot of sense that, that transforming society can transform man. In fact, let's just make this comment. This is a very religious thing that we're going to be talking about because what it's saying is that man can be transformed by society. In effect, he can be born again. Yep. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, so we have two analogies that we, we use in, in, in the way that you talk about this. The foundation, the house, and also the tree which is another illustration that Jesus uses. Just for about 30, 45 seconds, talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, well, again, it goes back to the idea of the fruit, right? What, what kind of fruit does this tree produce? And so if we look at the, the fruit from the, the Marxist roots that come up through, uh, does it produce the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness? Or does it produce covetousness and enviness and envying and bitterness and hostility and all these things. And I think if you look at the end result of all these things, it's not producing good fruit, it's producing bad fruit. Right. So we can critique it. Uh, Jesus uses this parable not only for the, his first century audience, but it's obvious that this is a binding universal principle that everybody can understand. Right. You know, uh, the, the tree that has wicked fruit, uh, roots is going to produce wicked fruit and so on. So, very easy. So we want people to think in these terms and to think foundationally and to think in terms of ideas have consequences yes. that come out in the analogy of the tree. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We're just getting started here with our worldview-oriented series here with Joshua Klein. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Joshua Klein. We're talking about the worldview uh, influences on our culture today. And now, starting in this segment and over the next several episodes, we're going to be getting into particulars. Now, Josh, we want to start. You've mentioned Marxism a couple of times. Now, maybe, maybe as we talk about this, one of the things people are going to say, look, Marxism, it's dead, it's gone, communists are gone, the Berlin Wall fell down. Um, but anyone who, can, who examines these ideas knows that Marxism has not died. Right. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But we need to talk about particulars for those who aren't familiar with it. So let's begin with that. Oh, actually, Karl Marx said that communism begins where atheism begins, which is interesting. So uh, Karl Marx, and uh, if, you read, if you ever take a chance to read the Communist Manifesto, he lays all of these things out. He says that we disdain to uh, hide or conceal our views. And he said that... Uh, the communists openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. And so Ka Karl Marx's ideas were not unique to him, but he's the one who really kind of formulated it all and popularized it and, and kind of laid the groundwork for everyone that falls after him. So his, his ideas came out of the Industrial Revolution. And so the way he saw it was that, you know, capitalism is this system that leads to great inequity and that he divided society up between two groups. You had the bourgeoisie, who were the people who owned the factories, and the proletariat, who were the working class. And that the bourgeoisie were getting rich by exploiting the proletariat. They were uh, not paying them the true value of their labor. And, and what was allowing this to happen in a large degree was religion. 
because he called religion the opiate of the masses. It stupefies people into servitude because the Bible says things like obey those people who God has placed in authority over you. And so uh, what Karl Marx thought was that the conditions would get to the point where the even, even though there was religion, that these people would wake up and they would look around and they'd say, there's way more of us than there are of them. And they would expropriate the expropriators, right? They would take right. over the means of production and, and collectively own them. And yes. then they, they would usher in this uh, socialist, because socialism is where the means of production are owned by the community at, at the whole. But ultimately, this is the first step in the path to communism, where there is no private property, because he saw private property as one of the great causes of all, all the sufferings that you see uh, in the world. And so that's where Karl Marx is, is kind of his starting point in all of these ideas. It was mainly economic. Yes, yeah, so the war in society, the, the main conflict for Marx uh, was economic. So what they call the dialectic between those two. I always love the word bourgeoisie. You know what I mean? You can just say that. It makes you sound smart. But basically the people who owned capital. And they were taking advantage of the, the folks who worked for them, essentially, right. is the case. And they expected them to throw over. Throw, throw. So, so, so when, we think, when we think about this, you, you mentioned about the abolition of private property. Let's explore that a little bit. Now, the, any, any person out there going, wait a minute. Um, the abolition of private property property, the Bible has something to say about private property. Let's explore that a little bit as the antithesis to this idea. Right. Well, so uh, where do you get the idea of private property? In Exodus uh, 2015, thou shalt not steal. So thou shalt not steal assumes that you're taking something that belongs to someone else. You also see in Exodus 2017, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manslave or his female slave or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And the whole Marxist, I mean, when you look at the fruit of the tree, one of the, one of the, the big things that stands out to me is covetousness. It's not fair. They have too much. And so we want to take their stuff and, and uh, redistribute it to right. other people. Right. And so, again, at the root of this is this idea that private property is a bad thing. Now, Again, when you look at the goal of the Enlightenment and to try to solve society's problems, if you look at what happened when the Pilgrims started in Massachusetts, they tried this kind of communal yes. living, right, the tragedy of the commons, and what happened? They almost starved to death because, yes. uh, you know, it doesn't work. But when, they, when William Bradford declared that everybody's going to get their own piece of land and you're going to, you know, car harvest your own uh, crops, well, then they had an abundance because, again, it goes back to what's human nature like. And if you're motivated by self-interest, if, if I see a benefit in this, I'm going to work hard because I reap the rewards and then everyone benefits. And so again, right off the start, you see this contrast, uh, not only with, with the way people really are, but also with what the, the Word of God says, right? Yeah, so, so we see echo, uh, obviously echoes and effects of this in our, in our modern society of uh, forces that should have the right to confiscate others' wealth beyond the legitimate function of the state. In other words, you know, for security, police, and those kind of things. Um, so really antithetical to the biblical teaching that it's God who dispenses private property people ultimately. Now, some people get it by theft and all that other kind of thing, but if it's, if it's gained legitimately by not, by not affecting the rights of others, God is the one who ultimately gives it. Now, what we want to do here, Josh, is talk about some of the other points of, of Marx other than private property so we can set up the next episode. So let's talk about like the things that they, him and Engels, which, who was the other guy, let's survey those real quick over the next minute of what they wanted to abolish and let people think about that until we come back with our next show. Sure. There, there were six things that Karl Marx talked about eliminating in his Communist Manifesto that he wrote with Engels. So private property, the family, want to get rid of the family, want to get rid of individuality, so we should all become part of this collective whole. He wanted to get rid of nationalism, so this, this, and again, all these things are so relevant to what's being talked about today. He wanted to get rid of history, you could change history to be whatever you want, and get rid of eternal truths. And so you eliminate those things, and then that clears the ground, so to speak, to usher in uh, these ideas of yes. Marxism. Yes. So in our, in our uh, next episode, we're going to explore the particulars of how Marxism has morphed 
and change because the, the basic structures of it are still affecting our society, even though some of the particulars have, have changed, right? And um, how it's sort of infiltrated into the, into the culture uh, at large. And so friends, uh, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I've been here with uh, my friend Josh Klein. We're just introducing some of these worldview structures. We've been talking about Marxism. Um, don't think that because the, the communist revolution ended in the 1980s, that the effect of Marxism isn't here today. We're gonna find out more about that from Josh, about how it's actually front and center of how it's affecting people's worldview today and how we ought to critique it as the church. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. Come back for part two with my friend Josh Klein. Thank you for joining us.